Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the next episode of In Conversation Live from the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm Roger Kirby, and I'm uh, pleased to say that we have leading light Bertie Lee with us this evening, senior partner at uh, the firm Hempson's, as well as head of clinical neg negligence practice. He's been described as the doyen of defendant clinical negligence, and he brings over 45 years of experience to uh, bear on his work for defendants. And uh, I bet quite a few people listening this evening, I think we had a, uh, 1,400 registrants. I bet quite a few of you out there will have had uh, Bertie on your side. So welcome, Bertie. It's really lovely to have you with us. Um, Bertie, you, you work always as defending uh, medical practitioners. You, do you do any work at all with claimants or only work with defendants? No. In my profession, we are pretty much specialists. We aren't in most branches of the law, but in medical negligence, uh, either you act for defendants or you act for claimants, either because you're, you have institutional clients who are doctors or hospitals, and we only act for them. I have to say, I haven't actually been senior partner for a few years now, um, but I'm still in full-time practice. <laughs> You're sort of honorary for, uh, head of the practice, I think, really, Bertie, with all your experience. So, Bertie, you know, this program is, uh, we often describe it as Desert Island Discs without the music, and, and we'd like to get a bit of background. You're in Clapham at the moment, and you seem to have an awful lot of books around you uh, in, uh, in your study there. Very impressive. Um, but tell us a little bit about, you know, how you started life in Northern Ireland and, and coming, came across to the UK and so on. We'd like to hear a bit of that. Well, my parents were in the linen business in Northern Ireland when I was a child in the 50s. And uh, then, well, they moved back to England in 1960. And uh, then I actually went away to boarding school. I was very unhappy in a day school and doing very badly. And I was very lucky. I was rescued by an extraordinary school, uh, St. Christopher in Letchworth. It was co-educational, progressive, vegetarian, uh, mixed ability, not forcing you to work, but teaching you to learn and uh, teaching you to teach yourself, so to speak. And that's where I acquired the disciplines which have stood me in good stead ever since. Uh, my I had quite a strong family. My sister was in the law uh, and my brother, Rowley, was a, a chef, or still is. And uh, we were quite a tight family. And we've got a third sister. I've got a third sibling, Puff, who has got learning difficulties, mm. but still lives uh, in a marvelous place in, in Godalming, the Meath, and is very happy there. So uh, it, it's a strong family background. And so you, once you got to Letchworth, you had a ha happy upbringing there. It's a, a garden city, isn't it, Letchworth? So it must have been quite newly built when you, when you got there. Fa famous <laughs> Not quite. Not <laughs> quite. It was started at about 1900. Oh, right. I, went there, I went there in 61. So tell us about Hempson's, because that's a very famous law firm and it deals, uh, it's one of the leading law firms in terms of medical negligence uh, claims. Uh, so, how, did you start off very young at Hempson's? Uh, I know. Uh, I had a bit of a full start in journalism. I knocked around Fleet Street for a year, uh, and then I was looking for something to do. And my sister suggested I try Hempson. She had tried to sue them unsuccessfully, <laughs> uh, but she got on with them well enough to introduce me to one of the senior partners, and he very kindly took me on. They were extraordinary talented the, the people who taught me and I was very lucky to have them Peter Bayliss and Charles Butcher and Noel Lee Taylor who who trained me uh, uh, and they were a remarkable trio of lawyers and Hempson's had done all of the MDU and the BMA's work since oh the turn of the century about 1900 they started doing the MDU's work by suing them for, for a doctor who they wouldn't help in 1890, in 1894, I think. And they'd just done defendant work ever since. And as a result, we had a very strong medical tradition within the firm. 
And it's not only that we do that sort of work, we also act for royal colleges and we rub shoulders with doctors. Uh, I've been a fellow of the RSM for 20, 30 years, and I go to meetings that particularly interest me. For example, the obstetrics section, which I think is a wonderful organization. They have meetings last Friday of every month uh, in the evening. Uh, they're very convivial. People come and young doctors come and present their latest research and older ones come and give an overview. Uh, they're all short lectures, but they're a wonderful way of keeping up to date with what's going on in new developments and also meeting people. Obviously, I'm constantly on the lookout for new experts. Uh, you can't simply stay with the same ones all the time. Well, there are a few um, questions coming through. Michelle Drake says, uh, hi, Bertie. It's been a long time since we worked on a GP committee. Well, I bet a lot of people are going to be sending messages in. Um, and Quentin Dewar, Dewar, well, this is quite an interesting question. He says, assuming that harm comes to some patients through errors of commission, i.e. operating on the wrong leg, or errors of omission, i.e. refusing to see a deteriorating patient in the middle of the night, what is the best forum uh, at which a harmed patient can be heard and then appropriately compensated? I mean, do you think the, the current system it works effectively for patients now either well i think a system which works effectively for patients is one which gets them a lot of compensation presumably yeah. uh, it depends on what they want it de quite a lot of people who i come across actually don't really want compensation so much uh, but they get distorted by the process yeah. uh, the problem with the law is that it's failing to provide a service at a price that the public is prepared to pay if we've got a, a claim, modest value of £30,000 or something, uh, the costs that the claimant's side will run up if they go to trial on liability are, they start at about 200000 Well, if you are spending, and the defence side will be fifty or 60000 at least. So if you're going to spend 250000 arguing about 50000 you're not providing a service that you can expect the public to be prepared to pay for. And I think the law is very good. I think the law is very flexible. I think the law could very easily get its act together if it decided that it wanted to provide a service at the price that the public could reasonably be expected to pay. But unfortunately, I can't get the courts who control the fees, really, that are recovered by claimants to see it that way. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the word obstetrics and we had uh, Dame Leslie Reagan on just a few weeks ago talking about her uh, very interesting career and she's still very, very busy at St Mary's and so on. But, you know, obstetrics is probably the, uh, the most difficult area in terms of absolutely massive claims. Uh, so d just talk about your experience with, with obstetric uh, misadventure. Well, it's not only obstetrics it's also midwifery I and mean, leslie's great achievement i think is going to be that she brought the obstetricians and the midwives together who had been broadly speaking in separate armed camps uh, and changing childbirth when we effectively dismissed obstetricians from the management of normal obstetrics in 1993 uh, was appallingly destructive but you've got to realize now quite how far it's gone, because I don't think people do. The, I regularly see cases where a brain damaged baby is claiming over 30 million pounds. Now, a midwife earns, when she come, starts, she earns about 24,500, and she goes up to about 38,000. So the average midwife is earning about 30,000 pounds. If you've got a claim of 30 million, that means that the damages uh, are what the midwife will earn in a thousand years. It's mm. not right, it's not sensible, it's not proportionate. If you look at it from a macro point of view, the commissioners of the NHS are spending about three billion pounds a year on all obstetric services. Half of that, roughly, is transferred straight to 
uh, NHS resolution to meet the obstetric claims that will fall due in that year. So you're left with about 1.5 billion to pay for obstetric services. But the damages aren't paid in year. The damages are mostly added to the provisions held on the treasury balance sheet. And the amount of damage done in year is about nine billion pounds a year. And about 70% of that is going to be obstetrics. So we, let's say we've got about six billion pounds of obstetric damages caused in each year uh, when we are paying about 1.5 billion pounds to deliver the service. Well, it, it is lunatic. Because if you want to deliver a safe service that is proportionate, then what you ought to do is to have a properly trained workforce of midwives and obstetricians who have been trained together and worked together and who are experienced. People think that we've got a recruitment problem with midwives and obstetricians. We haven't. The recruitment's not bad. The trouble is the retention. We are so beastly to them that they give up. So everybody thinks that doctors and midwives are a commodity. And if you've got one midwife and one doctor there, that's what you need. It's not true. What you need is an experienced clinician who has confidence in their own judgment and their ability to manage the woman in labor or in gestation antenatally. And if you, if you knock the fun out of it, if you demolish their confidence, if you drown them in protocols, protocols are, they're, they're, they're the hazard to navigation in medicine because you have to move from conscious incompetence to unconscious competence. It's confidence which really matters for a clinician, which enables them to what we call, call have situational awareness, which is just an elaborate term for common sense and seeing the whole clinical picture. And if you've got protocols which you're trying to remember and trying to apply, it's the antithesis of being a confident person who is with the woman in labor. And uh, as I say, if you look on the web, if you look at burnt out midwife on the web, you will find there are cascades of stories by midwives who are giving up uh, because they've just had enough. They are too tense, they're too frightened, they're not enjoying it. The RCOG does a survey of its juniors and it found, uh, I think 2019 was the last one, they found that 15% of middle grades said that they were thinking of giving up their specialty every month. It's extraordinary. And as a result, you've got 25% rotor gaps. Uh, now, a rotor gap is when there aren't enough middle grades to fill the rotors. So what you do is to make them all work at night to fill the gaps. And the trouble is there isn't any training at night. So you're diminishing future training and they know this, they feel overexposed, they don't have the same confidence, and then you make them move around the country of their middle grade doctors so that they never get any continuity of training because the firm has been destroyed. So they don't have one consultant who is responsible for them for years on end and who understands what they can do and help them to do a bit more. The sort of training that you had we have destroyed and it's a great pity we'll come on to that because there are lots of uh, issues around training but peter mcdonald does uh, a lot of uh, defensive work i think um in medico legal uh, is a, a, a surgeon um and peter's saying will the law ever be able to take into account the context and the conditions under which doctors work and i, I mean maybe particularly in obstetrics in in outfits like shropshire where they've had such uh, criticism you could argue that the the circumstances in which the midwives and the doctors are working is far from perfect so what would be your answer to peter in terms of the context that um, doctors find themselves almost never uh, do we find 
claims like this being brought against individual clinicians. They've all got the benefit of NHS indemnity. Uh, and if you are working in the NHS, they don't sue individuals. So if you are working in an adverse environment and you're insufficiently supported, it's your boss, your, your employer who is being sued. And it doesn't matter very much to the court whether it's individual unreasonable activity or uh, whether it's negligence which has been caused by the situation. So that doesn't affect us so much. Of course, it matters a lot in private practice where yeah. there is a great deal of personal responsibility. But private obstetrics is now a vanishing trade. There are only a handful of senior doctors who are still doing it. And I sometimes wonder how they sleep at night yeah. when they ask me, I advise them to give it up. <laughs> well, uh, Peter McDonald was one of David Sellew's big supporters. And of course he, he ran into problems. So he was, he's been on our program actually talking about six months ago. Um, but you, staying on just for a little while on, on obstetrics. I mean, you say that, that there are, just a handful of people doing private obstetrics and they must be paying enormous um, uh, premiums for insurance, mustn't they? If the claims are 30 million per brain damaged baby, I mean, how much, how much are they paying uh, every month? I think, I think they're paying about 4,000 pounds per delivery, but I haven't seen those figures for a couple of years. I, I mean, one of them I know was doing 150 and was supposed to be paying 600,000 a year for his indemnity. Wow. Um, when the first of these mega claims was brought, uh, Lim, Dr. Limpo Chu uh, in the 1970s, uh, Lord Denning said we couldn't afford to pay damages on this scale. It was contrary to public policy. Uh, and they went up to the House of Lords and her advocate, Christopher French, opened the case to the Lords by saying this proposition is quite ridiculous because any doctor in the country can get unlimited cover from the defence organisations for £100 a year. And it is absurd for the learned master of the roles to say that these claims uh, are um, unaffordable. Dr. Lim was awarded about 229,000 pounds in 1979. And uh, over the course of the rest of her life, uh, her fund actually grew. So that when she died in 2009, I think, her estate was 1.2 million pounds. And that was even though uh, there was rampant inflation uh, between the 1979 and uh, when she got her award uh, so that the damages had inflated fivefold but even so her fund had kept pace with inflation uh, over the course of her lifetime as well as meeting uh, all of her needs it, it, it was a different time so David Wilkinson says, do you think that, that um, a, a no-fault system will uh, uh, ever uh, be introduced? You know, uh, isn't it New Zealand that uh, introduced that system? Jonathan Simmon is asking the same question, actually. Um, what are your thoughts about that? It, well, if that's David, he was head of the World Association of Anesthetists. So I'd better be careful. He's pretty well informed on what goes on overseas. I always thought that no fault compensation uh, was a nonsense because I didn't understand what you were compensating for. If you've got a, a negligent tort that someone has done something to a person, then it's understandable that they should compensate them. But if they haven't, if there is no fault, I do not understand the basis on which you should tell the rest of society uh, that they should compensate that person and keep them. Supposing, for example, just take a, a, a random example, Roger, supposing that you had a very successful urologist who was earning a shed load of money. Supposing we say he was earning about 10 times the average earnings of a, a, a citizen. And supposing that uh, he then goes to see a doctor who negligently cuts some of his tendons or blinds him, so he can't operate. 
anymore. Now, he will have lost an enormous amount of money. Should the rest of society pay to preserve that uh, imbalance? Should the man who was earning 10% of what the great urologist was earning pay to keep the retired urologist in the manner to which he was previously accustomed? Where is the equity or reason in that arrangement? I don't understand it. But on the other hand, at the moment, we have got, since, since the argument was first put forward, and I've formulated that view, we've now got a system in which the law, as I say, is not providing a service at a rate that I think the public can or should be expected to pay. And, and so I rather, rather fancy that the argument has swung more in favour of no fault compensation because the law has so discredited itself. But there we go. Well, there's a question about why trusts and health boards aren't penalised for not investing more in staff and resources, uh, especially in obstetrics, where spending on scan facilities and support networks and so on. I mean, I think, I think it is the case that we've seen the sort of estate of the NHS gradually deteriorate uh, over the years, isn't it? What, what are your thoughts well, about well, it, the short answer is that it is ridiculous to penalise trusts for not providing a service when the reason they're not providing it is because they can't afford to in the first place. And if you penalise them and take more money away, uh, it, it's even more absurd. We have so run down the NHS uh, uh, since the oneless money, money ran out uh, 10 years ago at the time of the global financial crisis uh, that as you say, you've got a, a maintenance backlog of 6.5 billion. Uh, Imperial, which was our biggest trust in London, has itself got, one trust hospital's got a maintenance backlog of 650,000. Well, if you've got a maintenance backlog, so your buildings are falling down, so that your lifts aren't working half the time, you can't run a proper service. You are diverting the time and energy of your staff to making do and mend. And the, the real lesson of COVID is that uh, a health service is not an optional extra. We have been running for the last 50 years on the basis of an episode of Enoch Powell, which was that the public's demand for healthcare is infinite and the supply will always be finite. It's an op optional extra. It's a bottomless pit. What we've learned from COVID is that everything else actually depends upon healthcare. And if you lose healthcare, the economy closes down, your education closes down, your culture closes down, your ability to socialize closes down. You're not even allowed to have your friends around for a meal. So everything now depends upon healthcare if, it's, if things are allowed to rattle out of control. And you've got to have sufficient resources for the black swans. We were told that there were going to be pandemics. We knew that this was coming. We knew that we were badly prepared for it. Exercise sickness in 2017 and another one done in Scotland found there was appalling unpreparedness. And these warnings weren't coming from nerds uh, in anoraks. Uh, one of them came from Bill Gates who gave a celebrated TED talk. Another one came from uh, Obama. Uh, who gave a, a major lecture on it five years ago. Everybody knew that it was only a matter of time before we had a global pandemic. And the extraordinary thing about this one is that it is in fact a relatively minor, mild disease. And uh, we are very lucky. But the next pandemic, sooner or later, we're going to have a pandemic which threatens our species. And unless we get our act together, we are going to have something far, far more dangerous. Uh, and SARS and MERS and SARS and all the other things that we've seen are much more unpleasant. Uh, the Black Death wiped out uh, half the population of Europe. 
which Europe was effectively the known world as far as we were concerned then. And uh, the Justinian's Black Death, which was probably a similar bacillus uh, in 541, that wiped out 40% of the population of the largest city in the world, Constantinople, in a month. And uh, the historian at the time, Procopius, said that it had threatened the annihilation of mankind. Now, uh, you could say that when you're pursuing an audacious experiment to find out how many people uh, the planet can support before it bursts or fails as a biosphere, whatever that means, you could say that this is, this is a fortunate part of the arrangements and that Malthus was right. Uh, and if we don't want war or, or famine, we better have settle for pestilence to control our population. But that's not likely to be a popular view uh, uh, amongst fellow citizens. So I think that we really ought to get our act together and provide proper resources for the NHS. But the idea that we should penalize them with the resources they've got, I think it's bit rich, thank you. Well, I mean, that gives me a chance to give your book, which is um, nearly complete now. I've been reading it um, this afternoon and before that, the, the, a, med a medical manifesto, which is nearly complete. I mean, you've got so many different um, uh, and, and excellent ideas in there. Uh, uh, so it would be great to see that uh, on the shelves, hopefully later this year. David Cochran's got an interesting question. He, he says, did the Supreme Court get M Montgomery right? She failed twice in Scotland. Um, and of course, the surgeons listening to this uh, will all be worried about the, how they give really true informed consent to a patient taking into account all their individual um, needs and, and, uh, and, and uh, particular uh, uh, problems. So what, what do you think about Montgomery in terms of the, changing the laws around consent and litigation secondary to that? Bernie? Well, what Mon the thrust of Montgomery is that you've got a duty to advise people about the alternatives available to them. And I think that's entirely right. Uh, uh, and I've no quarrel with that at all, but I don't think people really understand uh, the implications of it because you, if, you've got to advise people of all the alternatives available to them at every clinical consultation. And this includes every consultation in general practice and every, consul every time you go to an accident department or every time you go to an outpatient clinic irrespective of whether anyone is advising you to have surgery. We've still got this nonsense of the consent form in which we expect people to consent to have surgery. I've never seen a case where anyone sued because they didn't consent to have surgery, except for those cases where someone made a mistake and cut off the wrong limb or took out the wrong organs. Uh, People always consent to have surgery. That's why they climb onto the operating table or go into hospital and take off their clothes and uh, listen to endless answers, the same damn fool questions endlessly. They want the surgery. The difficulty with Montgomery is that you've got to uh, give them this advice about all the alternatives available to them every time you meet them. Uh, the second difficulty is that in my world, if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. I talked to a doctor about what they said to a patient for five minutes, and they lapse into saying, I would have said that, meaning that they concede that they should have said that without asserting that they did so, because of course they can't remember the details of the conversations. So what we have to do is to create defensible records of the advice that is given. And you can't do that in uh, the average outpatient clinic. You simply, it's physically impossible. So what we have to do is to take the work off the clinician's shoulders. We have to put the work online and get people to work for their appointments and work for their operations by working through an algorithm, which will prove that they have read the material and understood the material. And people like you should be preparing sophisticated algorithms with cartoons, with films, 
with all sorts of things which, which will explain to people what's involved. And then you will have a defensible medical regime and you put the work on the patient. We've got to stop pretending that being an empowered and autonomous patient is a soft option. It isn't. You've got to work at it. There are, of course, a lot of people who won't be able to use that. Some people are IT illiterate. Some people are illiterate. Some people don't share a common language. Uh, absent pediatrics and obstetrics, the average patient in a bed in the NHS tonight is aged 80 with poor comorbidities and not remotely interested in listening to what doctors have said to them and want them to get on with it. But once you've got the standard model right, you can then address each of those uh, obstacles uh, on its own terms. Just as, for example, if someone goes into a hospital tonight with a space occupying lesion in their head or a dissecting aortic aneurysm, they only need to be told they'll be dead in the morning unless they sign here. And we have adjusted the consent process to suit that situation. And we'll have to adjust it to suit other situations. But at the moment, we haven't started. The NHS has not started to address the problems that are implicit in Montgomery. It only, the judgment was only given seven years ago, so you can't really expect them to. But I thought Montgomery itself, as a statement of the relationship between the patient and the institution was quite reasonable, unlike Chester and Afshar, where they said that if the doctor couldn't uh, remember, if couldn't persuade the court that he had mentioned a risk, we'd just change the rules of causation and say that that failure, that negligence actually caused the damage, even if the patient would have had the operation in any event. So the House of Lords does not have an unblemished reputation as far as consent is concerned, but I think they got Montgomery right. That was a neurosurgical case. In, in your book- The Bart's man, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Manifesto of Medicine, you say that um, the public demand a service that could only be delivered by an elite whilst being hostile to the existence of that. What did you mean by that, Percy? Well, it happens. There is a general assumption that doctors are a commodity, that they are interchangeable and the service will deliver what we need if it puts a doctor in front of me uh, who is or should be capable of doing the job. The reality isn't like that. Doctors are not interchangeable. Uh, and what we need are very good doctors. When they were trying to teach you to be a competent consultant, they recognized the obstacles that lay ahead of them. They made you work at it for about 14 years. They made you do the last four years in an advanced apprenticeship as a senior registrar. And by the time you were appointed a consultant, you could do more or less every operation in the book. And we made you work for about 120 or 140 hours a week because we knew that you were a slow learner. <laughs> we knew that you would only catch on if you spent a lot of time following patients. We kept them in hospital for you much longer so that you would see the natural history of disease and learn what would happen if you did this or that and understand what was happening to your patients. And as I say, we made you do it by staying in the hospital for many hours a week. We made you work for much longer as a junior and we attached you to one consultant on a firm. So you got continuity of training, you delivered continuity of care, and you learnt the natural history of disease. As Isla said, uh, the disease itself became your teacher. Well, we're not doing it that way now. Now the patients are in the hospital for much less time. Most things are now done as day cases. Uh, so the doctors don't get to watch them. Secondly, they don't get continuity of training because they are shifted uh, every six months from one hospital to another and when they're in one hospital they're usually working for mega firms uh, with about 30 consultants in their specialty uh, most of whom now have been through the same training that they are going through uh, so we have much less training we have much less experience of the natural history of disease and we don't have the same intuitive grasp as a result of which 
the job is becoming much less fun and much more difficult. Even though they now work a fraction of the hours that you worked as a junior, the burnout rates are much higher. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. I'm not advocating the old system because uh, it wasn't always very good for patients, as we, as we both know. Um, but it, it did, it did have the virtue of delivering hands-on experience of the natural history of disease. And the slowest learners made it as a result. Yeah. Well, you also talk about the intolerance of failure. And we've mentioned Dave, uh, David Sello, but um, uh, Hadiza Babagaba is another example of, of um, uh, some would say, a miscarriage of justice. What, I mean, what are your thoughts about the way that she was treated? Um, uh, well, in the first place, we have to concede that the first victim of that disaster was not Hadiza. It, it was Jack Adcock who, who died and he paid with his life. He went into hospital with a treatable disease, sepsis, and we didn't give him a, a decent uh, service, the service he was entitled to expect. Uh, the doctor uh, had just come back off mat leave. I don't know how many times she had ever diagnosed sepsis. Uh, she was not in uh, a, a favorable uh, environment, I think, for treating that patient. The difficulty is when you step back uh, and look at what happened to Jack, uh, the first thing to note is that the, somebody did a study in Leicester uh, and found that there were significant delays in most patients who presented to that accident department uh, with sepsis. When I was at NCPOD, we did a study uh, on the way in which sepsis was treated nationally, uh, just say sepsis. And we found that the average case of severe sepsis suffered a 9.5 hour delay in diagnosis or the institution of treatment. Well, that is roughly speaking, the delay that Jack sustained. So what he got, was a rotten service, but it wasn't Dr. Bauer Garber's fault. It was the fault of the training she was given, the setup of, that she was working in, the pressure she was under. We say that uh, these cases are as rare as hen's teeth, and that it's frightfully rare that you will get a doctor who is so incompetent as to be guilty of uh, non-negligent uh, negligent, grossly negligent manslaughter, but by some extraordinary chance, the nurse she was with on that day was guilty of the same crime. It was another freak event which came together. So the difficulty is that we, the law itself is an ass. We have this idea that we have no definition of what gross negligence manslaughter is. We explain the facts to the jury, and we say, you decide whether that is grossly negligent, so grossly negligent as to be criminal. And if you do think it is criminal, we then say that the doctor is guilty of the, one of the most serious crimes in the calendar. Well, we don't do that in any other walk of life. For example, in motoring, we have six grades of criminal activity before you're guilty of motoring manslaughter. Um, there are three grades of causing death by careless driving. And then there's three grades of causing death by dangerous driving. And um, there's one case which illustrates the gulf between that sort of criminality uh, and Bauer Garber's case. Uh, a, a young man has his car modified to make as much no noise as possible. He goes driving out at four o'clock to pick up a couple of girls. I think he was going to pick them up. He drove past at such, uh, making so much noise that they argued with him. And he drove the car and hit them with it. He then drove on, turned around and drove back, uh, uh, and again, making as much noise as possible. This was at 4 a.m. And then he went straight on. He didn't stop to help the girls. He had taken a lot of alcohol, I think, and he then went to a petrol station a few miles down the road and reported 
the a, a dishonest account of the facts to the police. Now that is not manslaughter. That was uh, causing death by dangerous driving. And yet it is deemed by the law to be less serious than motoring manslaughter, which is the crime that she is committed and guilty of committing, because at the time, in the in the moment, fit of the moment, she didn't notice or failed to take on board the fact that this child had an elevated lactate and a depressed pH, so he obviously had a metabolic acidosis. When he came in, uh, he was given fluids, I presume at her prescription, not a colleague, uh, and she was misled by the fact that the child perked up. Well, most people who are clapped out uh, as a result of having sepsis will perk up if they're given fluids. It's one of the essential components of the sepsis six. And the judge said that her crime was to be misled by this improvement. Well, this is, this is, this is the law of the lunatic asylum. We shouldn't have anyone who is guilty of a crime if they were honestly doing their best to help as a doctor. It can't be criminal to do your best. You may be saying competent, you should be struck off. I have no problem with that. But you may very well be justified in losing your job. But the idea that we can criminalize it, in that courtroom when she was sentenced, there may have been 40 or 50 people present. 49 of them have one thing in common. They had not tried to help Jack Adcock. Bama Garba had. And yet she was the one who everyone turned around and pointed the finger at. It's not sensible. Right. It caused shockwaves through, especially amongst junior doctors. Uh, you know, there was a, uh, an atmosphere of fear, which probably even now still hasn't abated. Um, interesting question from Bina Kumari here. Thank you, Bina. Uh, she'd like your thoughts on inquests into suicides, which are becoming increasingly adversarial. If a patient kills himself, uh, it's assumed that this was a failure of mental health services and hence somebody is at fault. If you, she's asking, if you, are you seeing more negligence cases in relation to suicide? Yeah, we are, uh, certainly, uh, 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 and she's quite right. Uh, the difficulty is, of course, that if you've got somebody who is at risk of taking their own lives, especially a young person, it's easy to see what the remedy is. Lock them up, and you can do that. Yeah. Uh, if there is any risk of someone taking their own life, uh, judge with the retrospectoscope, you say to the doctor, why on earth didn't you section them? It's so easy. Yeah. You will ruin their lives. The trouble with mental health is, and quite a lot of other health as well, it entails some toleration of uncertainty. Nobody ever sues for the sensible risk that was taken by the brave and intelligent clinician who assessed the patient as carefully as they could, and as a result, took a calculated risk that the danger in this case was not great, and the patient's ability to grow up uh, depends upon the courage and intelligence of that decision. But they, doctors only get judged with the retrospectoscope, and there are always plenty of signs that you can pick up that would have put somebody uh, on the key vive who, who was gifted with the second sight as to what was going to happen in the exegesis. Uh, so I do, we do see a lot more of them, and they are they're the victims of the increasing science, which is surrounding psychiatry now, which can be mistaken by the unwise uh, and the unlettered uh, as evidence that these that the people are more predictable than they are. But you're you're always so supportive of doctors, which is why we all like you so much. But I mean, did you ever think of being becoming a doctor yourself? <laughs> Not really. Um, I was one of those generation who did better at arts at O level than he did at sciences, and so he was told he, uh, he, he shouldn't try to do science A-level, so that door was really close to me at that point. Um, I wasn't, when I was young, I think, so keen on the sick either. 
uh, I don't think I was terribly sympathetic. Uh, I think I would have had that kicked out of me if I had been lucky enough to go into medicine. I do have enormous respect for doctors. I think what they do is wonderful, and I think we should treasure it. But we'll only, we'll only do that if we help to make the relationship between medicine and society uh, less dysfunctional. And that, that's the problem that we've got. That's what my book's really about, how we've got to mend our attitudes. We've got to be less judgmental, less unreasonable of doctors. We've got to nurture them. I think we do have to change medical education radically. I've suggested, for example, that we ought to have a royal commission on medical training and academic medicine. Uh, and we've got to try to recreate the quality of medical training and the quality of new consultants that we had uh, when you were appointed. Yeah. What, what in your career? I mean, you, you must have seen so many cases. What, what, what are you most proud of what, what you've achieved? What, what do you think is your finest hour to, to paraphrase? I think working for NC Pod, <laughs> that was, the, I think that was the only time that I had uh, no doubt that what I did was useful. Of course, I know what, what NCPOD is. Just explain. And... Oh, oh, NCPOD is, is a wonderful organization. It's the National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcome and Death. And what they do, uh, I was rather hostile to it when it started in the 70s. I thought that it was uh, dangerous and was going to make it much harder for us to defend cases. Uh, but what, what happens is that the profession come together almost all unpaid, apart from a, a core staff. And they take a topic and they collect cases, usually, well, we collect thousands, but then they get whittled down. So we got 500, roughly speaking, usually uh, on a topic. And they reveal, we, we get clinicians in to study the notes and the reports written by the uh, responsible consultant, uh, all of whom give their time for nothing. And they write reports which are highly critical of what the care that was given. And they produce some statistics. The statistics are never really the core of it. What really motivates it is the illustrative vignettes, which have an enormous power uh, to change behavior. And uh, they publish two reports a year, and they really do change practice. They shine a light on good practice as well as bad practice. And it's all done in a way that uh, doctors and their employers can deploy. And it's all done on the smell of an oil rag. Their mm -hmm. total budget uh, for running the organization and writing their both reports is about a million pounds a year. If we had an NHS organization that was doing that, the budget would run up to 50 million pounds in the first couple of years. It's absolutely wonderful. And I think that it's a template of all sorts of things that we could do much better if we just handed them over to the medical profession and say, you do it. Because that's how NCPOD works. It's owned, in fact, by the Royal Colleges coming together and very grand members of the council of the colleges are nominated to sit on the steering group to uh, choose the topics and to scrutinize the results. Good question from David Carey. Thanks, David. Um, unpopular, I know, but there's a large degree of waste and, and mismanagement in the NHS. Indeed, every doctor and nurse could highlight some of these. A lack of resources may be the, uh, the case, but there's also a lack of effective leadership and management. Um, what's your opinion on that? Do you, I mean, do you think that the more doctors could get more involved in, in leadership and management within the NHS than they do at the moment? Yes, I certainly do. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that they should go into being chief executives uh, necessarily. I think we do now, now, 30 years after we set up the system, we do now have quite a lot of good people working in NHS management. But what I think that we ought to do far more doing about is devolving the management of the service to the clinicians on the shop floor. And we ought to get on with it now 
whilst we still have a generation of doctors who went through the old training and uh, who got their, got their spurs under the old consultant contract, which was uh, demolished in 2003. Uh, when we decided that we should, we thought that doctors, broadly speaking, were ripping us off, uh, spending all their time in the street of shame or, or the golf course when they should have been working in their NHS jobs. And so we decided to pay them, find out exactly what they were doing and pay them for it. Within a couple of years, we found out that the vast majority of them were doing far more and there wasn't enough money to pay them for it. So we cut down on the money, but we'd already cut down on the job description. And so people who had been giving 15 PAs uh, of time, uh, that's programmed activities for our blocks uh, a week, were cut down to 10. And the result was that we have generated an attitude that there is such a thing as overtime. You see surveys in which doctors tell you they're giving a lot of voluntary overtime. Until 2003, the concept was meaningless uh, and doctors dealt with the needs of their patient. A lot of people still are doing it, especially those in the high risk specialties. Uh, but um, we've got to get back to that situation because the present generation of senior consultants are a national treasure. And whilst we've got them, we should get them to lead the service and to create a reform service. Uh, I, I, I've said I think we ought to have a Royal Commission on Medical Education and Training, but we've got to have it on the shop floor. We've got to find a way of regenerating the medical firm and we've got to have clinical leadership from, from senior consultants. Quite a few of our speakers on this uh, series have said that. Um, there's, there's a nice question here from Penelope Phillips. Um, what do you think uh, the, is the primary motivation for litigation by patients and families? She says that, uh, Penelope says, I worked collaboratively with our local trust following the death of my daughter, who was a medical student, but it took a long time to break into the system. So I do understand why patients and families resort to legal action. Do you think we need better systems to break that uh, kind of vicious cycle? That's quite a touching question. Well, yes, um, it certainly could be improved and NHS resolution are trying very hard to do so. The fact they've now changed their name from being a litigation authority to being resolution uh, is pretty good evidence of that. So. Uh, and the fact that the costs are so prohibitive that everyone's trying to avoid litigating anything is also evidence of that. But I, I agree it's a work in progress. As to what motivates people to sue, I think there are all sorts of drivers which may well be case specific. Mm -hmm. Sometimes because they want to find out what happens. Sometimes it's because they don't want it to happen to anyone else. Sometimes it's because they're very angry. Sometimes it's just because they're very greedy and want a lot of money. And I see claims quite regularly that horrify me that anyone could sue about a disappointing outcome, suing the employer of someone who tried to help them uh, when everyone has been kind to them, done their best all the way through, and they haven't suffered very grave damage. So I do see those cases, but there are an enormous range of different purposes for litigation. What's the highest damages you've ever been faced by? Uh... Well, the highest case I've ever seen was one in uh, Jersey. Uh, I wasn't involved in it, but I advised a group of doctors about it, uh, where a couple of children were very badly brought up by their parents. When I say very badly, I'm talking about as badly as you could possibly imagine. Starved, beaten, sexually abused, and so on. So bad that they, uh, one of them is in a medium secure unit and the other one is just as badly damaged. Uh, and it was inflicted by their parents and uh, their claim was against the state of Jersey 
because they said they should have um, taken them into care earlier. Uh, the damages each claimed on the schedule was well over a hundred million pounds because in Jersey they don't have the Damages Act that we have and they didn't have a system for uh, awarding periodic payments. Uh, neither child had testamentary capacity so in the event that either of them died this award would fall into their estate on intestacy and would probably be inherited by the mother if she outlived them. So it, it was a piquant case as well as being appalling. The total damages that were claimed were about what, this, what the island was proposing to spend on its only hospital, which badly needed rebuilding. Um, eventually they did, were able to settle a partial settlement, but those figures weren't made public and I, I don't know what they were eventually for the settlement, but it, it was horrendous. And that's about the most expensive I've ever seen. We're running out of time, but just you know, some thoughts. On, and we've got 75 questions. In, so I'm so sorry that we haven't got time to answer any more of them. But we are getting distress signals from general practice at the moment, um, Bernie, uh, Bertie. I think, you know, maybe there's a, the, the, it's the vi virtual consultations that are bothering um, the GPs. They're having to do so many of them. And uh, patients are wanting more and more contact. And they're saying that, we're short of doctors, we're short of time, we're short of resources, it's sort of falling apart. Well, I mean, any thoughts about that? Yes, I think general practice is absolutely uh, precious. Uh, uh, Michelle Drage, your first questioner, and I worked on the uh, BMA G GP committee 25 years ago, and uh, You've got to realize that general practice is the only part of medicine where your relationship is with the patient rather than with the disease. Most other medicine, including primary care practice in hospital, the relationship is coterminous with the disease episode and it's often only one encounter. And the relationship with the healthy person uh, is only maintained in general practice. It is utterly precious. It is about 90% of all doctor-patient contacts are in general practice, and they do it for about 9% of the value. If you go and see your general practitioner tonight, it will cost us 37 pounds. If you go to a walk-in center attached to a hospital, it's over 40 pounds. If you go to uh, uh, the accident department, to meet, uh, it's over a hundred pounds. And if you get to see a consultant in the accident department, it's over 400 pounds. On each of those occasions, you will meet a stranger who is delivering a service uh, that isn't designed to keep you well, but to treat your illness. Whereas what we all actually want is to be kept well and to be supported with a toleration of uncertainty. We've got to rescue general practice. We've got to, uh, redesign it. Uh, we, at the moment, GPs, just like everyone else, we've got a problem of retention because we've knocked the fun out of it. And you've got more and more doctors going part-time, or less than full-time as they now call it, which diminishes the continuity of care that they can deliver and uh, diminishes the quality of the relationship. If you look at the great philosophers of general practice, like Michael Barlint and people, who, who preached that the most important or the most frequently used drug uh, that a doctor carried in his bag was himself or herself. And it's that relationship that we have to nurture. Now to get it back on the, on the road, we're going to have to give them more money as we're going to have to give almost everything in the health service more money. But uh, we, it, it won't happen spontaneously. We need to have a new charter for general practice of the sort that we devised in 1965. Uh, and we have to recognize that the only way in which our newly impoverished society can deliver the sort of health service that we want and we demand is by reinvigorating general practice, attracting people, more people into it, retaining them uh, in it and nurturing the relationship between the doctor and the patient. It is the most glorious part of medicine when it works, but at the moment we've kicked the stuffing out of it.
But yeah, I, I'd love to talk to you for another hour. We easily could, got so many questions, 84 questions I can see there. But um, we're gonna have to stop now because it's just one minute past eight. So I'm already one minute late. Don't go away. I've got a few announcements to make before I say goodbye. So um, thank you so much everybody for uh, tuning in and listening. Please tell your friends and relations about In Conversation. Um, tomorrow we have our COVID-19 session, which is at 12.30. And we've got Walter Ricciardi, a world expert uh, on COVID and public health from uh, Italy, talking about the pandemic responses around the world from Australia, Israel, and Brazil. We've got experts from those three countries. So that should be really interesting. Next week's In Conversation, we've got Kate Bingham, very famous lady now. She's the one that did the deal for the vaccines that uh, hopefully most of you watching tonight will have had. Um, most of you hopefully both jabs. Uh, so that's uh, a week today, Kate Bingham, interviewed by Simon Wesley. I should say Simon Wesley just been made a fellow of the Royal Society, so he's very proud about it. Gracious. That. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, he's so proud and we're so proud of the, of the RSM. And then we also have a series on climate change and we've mentioned Dame Leslie Reagan already this evening a couple of times. She's uh, running a program on the 25th of May about um, climate change and the unborn child, increase in birth defects and, uh, and uh, premature labor, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, remember these uh, webinars are free, but uh, free for you, but they're not free for us. So if you'd like to make a donation, the request comes up at the end of this uh, program. We've raised quite a lot of money already during the series, but we were short of about 4.5 million uh, as a result of the pandemic. So we need some more, please make a donation. And uh, we're back in Wimpole Street uh, in our building on the next Monday, the 17th of May. So come and join us. Uh, I'll be there. I, I bet Bertie will be there, actually. So uh, <laughs> come and meet the great man in person. Uh, that's Bertie, not me. So we'll see you next week. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And thank you especially, Bertie, the doyen of uh, defendant uh, medical, medico legal practice. Uh, uh, a great superstar you are. Farewell, right. everybody. Thank you, Roger.